Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with corn pudding. That's right, every year about this time, I try to post one side dish recipe for people that need something to bring to that family holiday gathering, but don't know how to cook, don't have a lot of money, and also probably tired. And if you're all or any of those things, this should really work out well for you, as it is incredibly delicious, very easy, and relatively inexpensive to make. And one of the big reasons for that is because we're going to use frozen corn, which, as you know, requires no prep other than letting it thaw and drain thoroughly. So what you see here is two one-pound bags of frozen corn. And by the way, when you go to buy your corn, there's going to be two different brands in the frozen case, and the bags are going to look the same, but one's going to be a dollar more than the other. And I highly recommend you buy the one that's more expensive, as the quality and sweetness will be superior. But either way, once our corn is thawed and drained, we're going to need to transfer it into a blender or food processor, where we're going to puree it with the other ingredients, or at least most of them. And how much of the corn we blend smooth can range from 0% to 100%. All right, that all depends on if you want whole corn in your pudding and exactly how much. And over the years, I've tried every different possible ratio, from using all the kernels whole to the version we're doing today where we puree it all, which is my preferred style. And I'm going to talk more about that on the blog, but basically that's going to be up to you, since you are, after all, the kernel of your corn. But anyway, like I said, I'm going to go with the fully smooth version. So I'm going to transfer all my corn in, and then to that, we'll add a few tablespoons of maple syrup, just to turn up that sweetness a touch. And usually it is white sugar called for here, but I do prefer the flavor of the maple. Plus, it always seems a little more holiday-ish. But anyway, we'll do a little bit of maple syrup, followed by six whole large eggs. Oh, and by the way, if we separated those eggs and whipped the whites and added them at the end, this exact same recipe would be called corn souffle, which is a lot more work, but comes out pretty much exactly the same. So personally, I do prefer the pudding. But anyway, let's continue on with a nice big splash of milk, followed by what looks like too much salt. Okay, we're going to need three teaspoons of kosher salt, which, by the way, is only like a teaspoon and a half of fine table salt. But as I've explained before, because kosher salt has such a large crystal, it looks like you're putting a crazy amount in, but you're not. You're putting the right amount in. And then speaking of right, it would be totally wrong not to put some cayenne in. So let's add about a quarter teaspoon of that, followed by our last two ingredients, some all-purpose flour and some baking powder. No, 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 not soda, baking powder. And as usual, please check and make sure it's from this decade. And then what I like to do at this point is take a spatula and give this a little mix before we blend it. Which seems kind of weird because we're going to blend it. But I'm always worried if I don't, when I first turn on the blender, all that baking powder will like fly up and stick to the top of the lid. And it will lead to some kind of major situation. And why didn't I simply just add the baking powder earlier and top it with other ingredients? That is such a great question. Anyway, moving on. Once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and blend this completely smooth. And as you know, I'm kind of a paranoid blender, so I always like to start off kind of slow, maybe pulse it on and off a few times to get it started, and then once I'm feeling pretty good about how it's going, we'll crank that up a bit and blend it on high until completely smooth, or at least as smooth as corn will get in a blender. And then what we'll do once that's been properly pureed is transferred into a mixing bowl, where we'll go ahead and add the last two ingredients, the first of which would be some melted butter. And what I have here is one stick melted, but we're not going to add it all. What we'll do is add about two-thirds, and then save a third to grease our baking dish. And then last but not least, we'll finish this up by adding our heavy cream. And we will grab a whisk and mix that until thoroughly combined. And if you're wondering why we're stirring this in now and didn't add it to the blender, well, for a few reasons. We generally don't want to overfill our blenders. And I'm always hesitant to blend cream because once overmixed, it can separate and turn into butter. So I prefer to add these two ingredients at the end. But anyway, like I said, we'll stir that until completely combined at which point it's ready to transfer into our baking dish, which, as you can see, I've greased with the rest of the butter. And what I like to do is set that baking dish on a baking sheet that I've lined with a silt pad. And I'll go into detail on the blog, but that's basically to insulate the dish a little bit so the heat's absorbed a little more gently than if we just put that dish in with no pan. And it's been my experience that for things bound with eggs, gentle is generally a good thing. And then once our dish is prepped, we'll go ahead and transfer our batter in, at which point we are pretty much ready to bake. Although, you know what, for old time's sake, let's go ahead and give it the old tappa tappa. And that's just to bring up any air bubbles to the surface, because if you didn't, those would have caused absolutely no problems. And then once that's set, we can go ahead and transfer that into the center of a 350 degree oven for about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes, or until beautifully browned and set, and also incredibly gorgeous. So this is what mine looked like after an hour and 15 minutes. And other than the appearance, there's two ways you can check to see this is cooked enough. 
Okay, if we give the dish a little jiggle, you will see a little bit of a wiggle, but it won't look like there's liquid under the surface. So that's looking perfect. And then the other way you can check if you want is with a toothpick or a skewer, which should come out relatively clean. Okay, if there's a bunch of raw batter stuck to that, put it back in, give it a few more minutes. But assuming it's cooked long enough, which mine did, we are pretty much ready to serve. Although I do like to let it cool down a little. I mean, piping hot's fine. But for me personally, the maximum flavor is perceived between warm and hot. Of course, having said that, this looked and smelled so incredible, I basically served it up immediately. And that, my friends, is one of the all-time great side dishes, holiday or otherwise. And while the taste and appearance are sure to dazzle, I think what's most impressive about this is the texture. It is so incredibly light and soft, you're going to be confused at how it's even holding its shape. It's just incredible. And I can't wait to get into this, but I had to. As a registered food blogger, I had to do the mandatory and gratuitous overhead portion on the plate, portion missing from the pan shot. All right, that's enough. Let's eat. And notwithstanding the cob, I cannot imagine a better delivery system for corn than this dish. It has such a deep, profound, corny flavor. It really is spectacular. It's one of those rare side dishes that's rich and decadent, yet light and airy at the same time. It really is hard to exaggerate how good this is. And believe me, I'm trying. But anyway, that's it, my take on corn pudding. So whether you're looking for a very memorable side dish to share at your upcoming holiday gathering, or you're just into really delicious things to eat, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.